Yes. Welcome to the weekly rally where we get to gather together mm -hmm. and we're all across the city. We're yeah. not confined by four walls, but we are all across the city, but we are yeah. um, worshiping together in yeah, God's yeah. spirit and truth and unity. Mm -hmm. And it's just a beautiful thing. But yeah, yeah, yeah. here we are. Yeah. And uh, notice that you kind of have something <laughs> something going on here. What's going on here? Is that what you want to know? To fall over. Yeah, I know. We've got a lot of a lot of Bibles here. Um, we are we're talking about the Bible today, and so yeah. I brought just a smidge of some of the just a, just a smidge of the ones that, that we have here in our house. We have this is um, this is a, a Bible that was given to the kids when they were born by friends that we had. Um, it's pink. It's cute. It's got pictures. It's nice. <laughs> yeah. Check that out. A little lamb on there. A little lamb. These are Bibles from our our parents or grandparents. I'm actually mm -hmm. not even sure, but they're um, they're really old. Here, yeah. you take that. This one, um, I mean, it's got the you got the zipper. That's so cool, right? Like it's got the zipper case. This one also has pictures for being very like color. Pictures. It's like cracking as it's you like, open it. And it smells. It's... Yeah, look, there's um, Esther. <laughs> um, cool. Very very cool. Okay, look, there's. Um, We've got a Greek, a Greek New Testament, yeah, it is. and a Hebrew Bible for yep. you. Yep, for those of you that know those languages. For you scholars out there. Yep, that's right. That's right. <laughs> this is my beloved Bible. It's a bit worn, you can see, but it opens like just. It's just like. Oh, yeah, it is. Just happy. It just makes <laughs> me happy when I open it <laughs> for many reasons, right? It's yeah. The Bible. Um, and then we have. Um, we'll come back to this. We have. The message, right? There it is. Yeah. A different, a different one. It's more of like a book, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, a little message. paraphrase. Um, and then we have some story Bibles, right? From um, storybook Bibles that are kids. This is one of our personal favorites. But this is also mm -hmm. the big picture story Bible for even smaller kids. So it's great. Yeah. They're both very good. And. We have a teeny tiny Bible. <laughs> there it is. Jonathan, you, do you have to zoom in you there? You have to zoom in there. Look at that. That's adorable. Um, this is a, a Bible the girls have for their yeah. for their Lego world. So yeah. they are um, in Legos. They have even even the Legos have a little Bible. <laughs> yeah, I know it's crazy. Can you open that? Can you get, can you read a little passage out of there? So this one doesn't open. I actually thought it did. Um, it doesn't open, but it's tiny. It's like. This is a Bible for ants. <laughs> it's a Bible for ants. For ants. <laughs> Just That's it's a movie reference. If you don't know, but um, but yeah. But today, the the point is actually that we're yeah. gonna talk about like how do you yeah how do you read the Bible yeah right. So we can have all these we can have all these different we have all these different kinds. It doesn't yeah. matter like what it looks like or what version you got or anything like that. But yeah. like it's probably the number one question that yeah. we get asked, right? Yeah. I mean, again, Mind of Christ series, you know, this, yes. was, this was from you guys um, in terms of the topic, but mm -hmm. you know, how do we read the book? How do we approach this book? Like, yeah. It's a guaranteed encounter with God's presence yeah. when you read the scriptures. Um, but so many people just wonder like, how do, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. Sweet. All right. I want to bless you guys uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, in the word of God today and in worship with community. And so guys, have fun. Hey everybody, it's Adam from Trinity Life. I'm excited to worship again with all of you guys and we will start off by launching ourselves into worship from the scriptures. And so we will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 14 to 16. Feel free to follow along on the screen and our threes have fun reading it out loud to each other so that the word of God can be proclaimed out for all to hear, at least all who are around you. Anyways, um, as we jump in to song, uh, I, I love what this passage illustrates for us and so emphatically, but we have the mind of Christ. And as I was meditating on this, um, so much of what's in our mind, the content of it is based on what we see with our eyes. And so let's take a moment to sing that God would be our vision. You are our vision. Maybe he may, he be the only thing that your eyes look towards and the, the eye of your soul, the eyes of your heart. May they only see Jesus and may that inform everything that's in you so that as we look to the mind of Christ, um, we, can, we can be formed by God in that. And so I bless you with that. In Jesus' name, let's read, let's sing.
Welcome back. Let's take just a moment to uh, to meditate and focus before we continue on in song. And I trust that the Holy Spirit, through our anthem declaring that God is our vision, um, is producing something in us. And hopefully, if uh, if where we started, that if if God is everything that we see, that that will form so much of our mind. And so I'm trusting that that is happening for you. And uh, and now we're going to move on to declare that God's word proves true. This is Psalm 18. This is David in the midst of turmoil, going ah. Oh, my enemies but but your word proves true and uh and he's standing on the faithfulness of god throughout uh throughout their history as a people and he is standing firm on the scriptures to that point saying god your word proves true and so we are going to do the same that no matter where we stand in our relationship to the bible god's word proves true and so let's just say that right now as like a battle cry together on the count of three your word your word proves true ready one two three your word proves true amen except i bet it was a little awkward and i bet you're still catching up to what i'm saying and so let's try it again all together now one two three your word proves true god yes it does let's sing together
There's so many bad things that happen in our city. How do I make a difference? How do I live for Jesus when there's so many distractions? I know I should read the Bible more often, but do I really need the Bible to know God? Is hell a real place? Would God actually send someone to hell? Someone told me women can't do certain things in the church, but would God want that? What does it mean that Jesus died for me? How can I forgive them after what they did to me? Who is God? Hey Trinity Life, we are finishing out our series called The Mind of Christ, and there's so many other topics we could talk about. There's so many other topics um, that you want to talk about, and we'll talk about those some other time. Uh, and But today, uh, we're going to finish with our last topic, and we're not talking about necessarily a controversial topic. Like, we've been dealing with some things in the past or with different interpretations, things like that. Today, we're just going to talk about how to read your Bible. That's something that uh, came up a lot in your sermon content surveys, and it's something we want to help you do um, and, and help you think through. Remember, we're trying to, um, trying to help you learn how to think about this. How, how should you approach your Bible? How, uh, what should you do to prepare yourself to read the scriptures? And then when you're in the scriptures, how do you actually read them? And here's something uh, here's something I say that gets people a little angry sometimes, um, or upset, or I don't know what the emotion is, but um, when someone asks me how to read their Bible, I, I say, well, just read it. And they're like, well, what do you mean just read it? I'm like, well, have you read your Bible? And they're like, well, no, I haven't. I want to know how to do it. I'm like, well, just try reading it. And guys, here's the key to learning how to read your Bible. You read it over and over and over and over and over again. All right, let's pray. I'm just kidding, that's not all I have for you today. <laughs> but, uh, but you have to start there. Like you have to at least try, right? Like I can tell you how to ride a bike, but until you actually get on the bike and try to ride it, you're not going to be able to do anything. I can say you got to pedal like this. I can say you got to try to balance. I can say you got to um, keep your head up. I can say you got to hold the handlebars right here. I can do all that. I can even, uh, um, but until you get on, you're not going to try. And when you get on, that's when I can hold the seat. That's when I can hold the handlebars. That's when I can um, help you. And that's what we're doing right now. Um, but I want to help you, which means you got to at least be willing to try. You gotta be at least willing to get on the bike. So um, start by reading it over and over and over again. If you've never read through the entire Bible, well, that's one, that, that's one reason you don't know how to read your Bible because it's a book and you have to read the entire thing front to back. All right, we, we, we piecemeal it because it's a bunch of different things, but uh, different books within one book. So you read a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, and I've, I've shown you this before, but, you know, most of us spend our t the majority of the time reading 
if you do read your Bible, you spend the majority of your time in this section. This is the New Testament, right? So you compare this to this, but even in the New Testament, um, we might take out like a few of the books like Philemon or Second and Third John or <laughs> Titus. You basically do what Thomas Jefferson did in his Bible. He, he literally cut things out, um, but we just ignore them, right? So you take out a little bit here and there. Maybe you don't read Second Peter or Jude. Those are kind of weird. Um, you know, you don't understand all of Hebrews, so you take that out. So really, let's take out a few more pages. So really, there's, there's this section. And then maybe you read some Psalms, right? So here's some Psalms here, right here, right? And, and you bounce around in here, um, but you leave the rest of this, um, and, then you, and then you struggle to read. My suggestion is to start from the beginning, Genesis, because Genesis actually means beginning, right? In the beginning, you start there, and you read all the way through to Revelation. And you try doing that. Now, I'm gonna to try to give you some principles today to help you as you do that, right? It's, it's holding the bike for you. It's, it's getting you started, some training wheels, right? It's, it's helping you out um, a little bit. These are things that I learned over the years from other people that I learned through just reading the Bible. Um, and so I want to hopefully help you do that today uh, because this is, uh, guys, this is so important to your faith. This is so important to you following Jesus. So if you don't actually know what's in here, you don't know God. Jesus is the Word made flesh, right? This is God's interpretation of a history. This is God, God's narrative of humanity. And so if you don't know what this says about who you are and who God is, there's no way you can follow Jesus. You're just blind out there in the darkness. And so you got to at least try. And now, yes, even today, there's, you don't, like, I know people struggle with reading today. Like, there's, there's audio. You can have, I don't know, probably Morgan Freeman or James Earl Jones read the Bible to you. Or, I don't know, who else has a good voice? Like, um, like, or have someone, have, have someone in your family read it to you, right? Like, um, you just had someone read the Bible to you, uh, read this passage anyways. Um, and there's different, there's different ways to do it. There's apps out there today that help you. Um, if you don't know, if you don't know, like, what you're doing. Um, but again, I encourage, if you don't know what you're doing, start at the beginning. Okay, um, that's gonna help you understand the entire story. I, a lot of people try to get people to start in the Gospels and to start with, with um, John, for instance, and I'm like, geez, like, if you start with John, guys, it's not that, it's not that that's not a good starting point, but it's not the starting point. It's not Genesis. Um, if you start with John, you miss all this. Like you miss all of that and you don't know what's going on and you're trying to piece it together. Now, um, I guess there's worse places to start than, than John. Like if you started in Revelation, that would be, that would be worse. Or if you started in, in, I don't know, Jude, you definitely want to get anything. Um, you can get some things out of John, but my recommendation is to start from the beginning. And, uh, and so, that way you're gonna understand what's going on in the rest of it. So, cause it's like going through a tunnel on a train, right? And the light on the train illuminates the rest of the tunnel. That's the Old Testament going in. In my opinion, Deuteronomy, and not just my opinion, a lot of scholars' opinions, Deuteronomy is the gateway. It's the door to the rest of the Bible. So if you've never read Deuteronomy, try reading Deuteronomy. Before you do that, you gotta read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. It's a gateway to understand the rest of the scriptures. Jesus quotes it so much. So when you're reading, when you're reading the Gospels and you're reading about Jesus, and he's quoting Deuteronomy, you'll know why. And you know why it's there, and what, what's, what the purpose is, and you know what it means, and, and it'll show you so many things. There's so much depth. Guys, you could read the Bible over and over and over again for the rest of your life, and not mine the entire depths of the scriptures. There's so much beauty and majesty here. And, and so my hope for you today is that you will see that and that you will desire it. Like the psalmist says in Psalm, uh, in Psalm 19, he says, 
Ah, it's sweeter than honey, it's richer than gold. Like he just wants it so much and he wants the Lord's instruction and he wants his decrees and he wants his his law and he wants his rules, he wants his directives, he he wants his he wants to know who God is, and he says it's better than anything else in this world. And so my hope for you today is that is that you will see that in the scriptures today. Um, because every time I open this book, guys, my heart smiles. Like I feel it inside. I'm just like, oh, I just love this so much because it, it's 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 showing me who God is. So, First Corinthians two, uh, we're gonna go into this passage here, uh, beginning in verse fourteen, and Paul here talks about two different types of people. The first one he says in verse fourteen is the natural person. He says this is the person who is not a follower of Jesus. This is the person who is in their flesh the natural person, right? Uh, he says, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for those things are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So the first thing, guys, uh, let's talk about the natural person. The natural person doesn't have the Spirit of God. You do, you, or you might, I don't know if you do, um, but if you do, you have... Um, a certain leg up in reading the scriptures, right? Because you have the Spirit of God in you. You have the author telling you how to understand the scriptures, right? It's a psalmist saying, open my eyes, Lord, that I may understand uh, the wonders of your word, right? It's, it's, um, it's the Spirit inside us. It's the author. So it's just like any book. If you were to uh, uh, read a um, novel, like a uh, Jane Austen novel, right? It's like having her tell you why she wrote what she wrote and what she means by what she says, right? Instead of trying to figure it out. We have the spirit of Christ to do that. And so the first place we wanna start that, that gives us a leg up from the natural person is the spirit in us um, leads us to humility. He's the author, right? So. One of the first things you want to do when you approach the scriptures is to put yourself in a posture of humility. So that's a how. How do you approach the scriptures, right? How does your heart approach the scriptures? A lot of us approach the Bible and we say, God, I want you to speak to me. That's pretty self-serving, actually, if you think about it. Okay, now we want God to speak, but a lot of times we go to it for God to speak about something because we want to know what to do or we want to, like, that can, be, that can be kind of self-serving. Like, just start off with humility and a posture of being with God. Just start there. Posture of being with God. What also gives us a leg up uh, on the natural person, because the natural person, it's not like they can't read words on a page, right? But think about it. If you are a spiritual person and you struggle with reading the Bible, how much more so a natural person who doesn't have the Spirit of God? So what gives us a leg up is we have the Spirit of God. That's called initial, well, I call it initial illumination. Okay, um, I actually wrote a book on the doctrine of illumination. You can go find it somewhere. Like I think three people have bought it. Now it's my, it's my published dissertation. I wrote on the doctrine of illumination. And so I call I kind, of, I kind of map out the whole doctrine. So we're gonna talk about three different types of illumination today. We're gonna to talk about initial illumination, progressive illumination, transformative illumination. In order for us to understand the scriptures fully, we need initial illumination. That is illumination unto salvation, okay? That is the spirit drawing us to the Father, okay? So initial illumination is needed. We have that. Right? If you're a spiritual person, you have that. So you can, you can understand the scriptures. Right? As the reformers say, they are perspicuous. Right? We talked about that weeks ago. Right? The scriptures have a perspicuity, a clarity. We can understand that. Guys, like I said, a nat the natural person can also understand words on a page. Um, but can they understand meaning? Right? And, and you're like, well, grammatical meaning, yes. But do they really understand the meaning of the text 
if it doesn't transform them, right? That's transformative illumination is what I call that. That's, that's my new concept. Um, it, it has to transform us. It's like James says, um, you know, the one who goes, who goes and looks himself in the mirror and then forgets what he looks like is like the one who reads the word and doesn't do what it says. Like it just sounds ridiculous, right? So it has to actually lead you into a life that's patterned after the life of Jesus Christ. If it doesn't do that, you didn't actually understand what it was saying. You didn't, act, you, maybe you understood the words, but you didn't understand the meaning of what the Bible was trying to, trying to do in you, in your heart, and in your mind, okay? So he says, the spiritual person understands those things. Verse 15, they judge all things but is himself judged to be judged by no one. So there's a progressive illumination that happens here. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you've been initially illuminated unto salvation. But like the psalmist says, we want the spirit to open our eyes to the wonders of God's law, of his instruction, right? So there's a progressive illumination there. Think about Ephesians 5.18. Paul says to be filled with the spirit. And he's talking to believers already. But he's saying still be filled with the Spirit. Why? Because we're oftentimes filled with other things. Just go back to the culture uh, session we just had, uh, the this, this sermon. So um, he says we want to fill ourselves with the Spirit of God, right? So be filled with the, there's a progressive illumination that happens there. So the posture of humility, but when I approach the Word, guys, I, I always try to remember to pray, Spirit, illuminate my heart and my mind. If there's any sin in my heart that is going to prevent me from understanding the scriptures, God, I confess that to you. I accept your forgiveness. I am in the blood of Jesus when I, when I come to this book, uh, because this is a guaranteed encounter with the presence of God. If I can do those things, right? If I can, if, if, if I can come in the blood of Jesus Christ. So here's the thing, guys. If you're not getting anything out of reading the scriptures, just being in the presence of God or hearing his voice, it's not him. It's you. It's not his heart. It's not his medium. It's your heart. And so that's where the progressive illumination of the spirit comes in, where we, where we pray to God, where we say, God, I need you to help me understand this so that it can transform me. That's the goal here, all right? This, the Bible isn't like, well, yeah, we kind of treat it as like a, an encyclopedia answer book. If you guys know what encyclopedias are anymore. Um, <laughs> but an answer book. We treat it, okay, here we go. We treat it like Google. There's something we can all understand. Google. We treat it like a search engine. What am I talking about encyclopedias for? We talk about, oh, uh, it's like, oh, I'm just going to type in, um, uh, the will of God for my life and see what pops up. Or well, I'm going to type in, what does God want me to do with this? And we'll see what pops up. Because the Bible is not, is not, it's not designed for that. It's not best understood for that. It's also not a science book. People are like, well, I'll type in uh, creation and evolution and um, uh, dinosaurs. And it's like, no, the Bible isn't a science book. It's not designed for that. The Bible essentially isn't about the what or the how, it's about the why. And if you can understand that, the Bible will help you understand, will help you um, learn how to think, how to discern, how to live. And so you will find those answers as you live out according to the scriptures and this narrative in, in the scriptures. And so, because the Bible doesn't deal with every little thing, right? It deals with what God's best is for us. It deals with God's pursuit of us. And then in light of those things, we know how to walk as children of light. We know how to be light. We know how to be salt. We know how to honor others. We know what it means to love our enemies and how to do that. We can overcome evil with good. We can bless those who persecute us. We, there, guys, we can be ministers of reconciliation, ambassadors for Christ, agents of restoration. 
all of that, we know how to do that, not because the Bible tells us exactly specific ways to do it, because the Bible gives us a template in how to think about those things in life. So, um, this, the natural person and the spiritual person are, are mentioned here. And then he says this in verse 16, For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? That's a, that's a pretty big question. Who can do that? Who can understand the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? You know, basically instruct others, right? Like who, who can do that? Oh, wait, Paul says, we can. But we have the mind of Christ. You see, he quotes here, he quotes Isaiah chapter 40 here, which is in the old covenant, which is when we didn't have the spirit of God dwelling in us. Paul now gives your new covenant reality. Your new covenant reality is that you have the mind of Christ. You know, a lot of people would love to quote Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 says, Oh God, your ways are, are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Well, if you're the natural person, that's true. But if you're the spiritual person, and not just general spirituality, if you are actually in the spirit, the spirit dwells inside you, you are a spirit person, you have the mind of Christ. God's ways can now be your ways. God's thoughts can now be your thoughts. I love how this Rabbi Abraham Heschel puts it. He says, he says, when we pray, we're joining God in his thoughts, his visions, his dreams. Like though you can operate in the mind of Christ. And guys, he was a rabbi in the, in the Jewish, in, in the, in the Jewish tradition, right? So he's not even operating the new covenant. How much more true of that is it for us? There's another, there's a monk who says this. He says, when you pray, when you commune with God, sure, say some things and then listen to his heart because it's, that's where you'll find the prayers of God. Find out what his prayers are. Find out what his dreams are. Find out what his desires are for you. Like, and, and instead of trying to ask God to give you your desires. So here we're in the new covenant and so God's ways can be our ways. His thoughts can be our thoughts. The law is actually written on our hearts because the Spirit of God dwells in us and we have the mind of Christ. Like, how amazing is that? So let's talk, let's close this out by talking biblical theology. Uh, remember back a month and a half ago, maybe two months ago now, um, we talked about your theological pyramid. We talked about biblical theology. Biblical theology is really what's going to help you understand the scriptures here. And so I want you to take time. Again, we're going to give you a minute on screen. Take as long as you need. You're going to take, by pausing it, you know, we're going to take time uh, for your R3 leader. So R3 leader wants you to help your, your group brainstorm themes that you could potentially trace through the Bible. So this is another how that's going to help you. Another lens to help you. So there's your posture of humility. Um, there's the, there's progressive illumination, submitting yourselves to the spirit. And, and then hopefully that leads to a transformative illumination, which is actually transforming you to live in the spirit. But, um, this is another lens, biblical theology. So what themes are in the scriptures that you can trace throughout the entire scriptures? So for instance, you could say, well, love. I can trace the love of God throughout the entire scriptures. Uh, just brainstorm the themes right now. So we'll give you a minute on screen and, and just have fun with that.
All right, I hope you had a great time doing that. I hope you guys thought of so many cool things, so many awesome themes that you can see in the scriptures, the kingdom of God, uh, the love of God, um, the Messiah, uh, I mean, the mercy of God. Uh, you can trace um, covenant, right? You could, you could trace... Um, uh, sacrifice. I, there's so many beautiful themes you can trace through the entire scriptures. Uh, the Holy Spirit, like we talked about, um, and, and just see uh, the, the fatherhood of God. Oh my gosh, I just keep on going on and on. There's so many cool things, so many cool themes. Um, guys, I even like, I've been reading the gospels through the lens of the theme of leadership and seeing how Jesus leads. So I'm reading the gospel specifically through that lens. I'm not just reading it generally. I've done that in the past uh, multiple times. I'm saying, okay, God, help me see specifically Jesus and how you lead and form me through that specific lens, that specific theme. And that, and the, so God has been speaking to me in, in fresh, new, different ways than I've seen before and heard from him before. And so that's where the themes can really help. So I'm gonna give you, uh, I'm gonna give you a general basic, like the basic biblical theological framework I'm gonna give you. And then, and then I'll give you an example of a theme that we can trace. Okay, and we'll close with that. Um, so the basic biblical theological framework is four parts. That was eight. Four parts, <laughs> is four parts for you. Creation, fall, redemption, and new creation, or sometimes people would call it restoration. Um, this framework is in the scriptures. People have been writing about this framework for a long time. So creation is the first part. So if you think about how this breaks down in your Bible, creation, <clears throat> Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, <laughs> just two chapters. Um, now, of course, we don't want to just cut off there because the whole thing is creation, essentially, right? Um, but fall happens and fall enters. So that doesn't mean creation stops, but fall enters, right? Genesis 3, on. Uh, redemption happens when Jesus dies on the cross. So um, Jesus comes, dies, resurrects, Pentecost happens, redemption, right? So, so technically, if you, technically, if you look at that, the Gospels are kind of, they're in this Old Testament, Old Covenant era, right? Because the New Covenant doesn't actually happen until Acts. That'll, like, you'll interpret the Gospels in a different way. You'll see them in a different light if you have that in your mind. Um, because we often say, oh, like, the Old Testament's so hard for me. I can't, can't read it. Jesus is pretty much an Old Testament prophet, guys. Um, I mean, he acts like one, he talks like one. He, that's why the disciples are like, stop talking to us in riddles, Jesus, we can't understand you. And he's quoting the Old Testament prophets all the time. John the Baptist is also like this. So, um, uh, new covenant happens, new, uh, uh, sorry, redemption happens, and then new creation, which is kind of revelation, uh, parts of it, uh, are, are what closes that out. But it's also what the New Testament talks about a lot. Colossians 1, God is reconciling all things to, to himself, right? That's a new creation motif. So you have these four part, this four part framework uh, for biblical theology, for how you should view the text. And guys, that helps you put everything in its context. So oftentimes people say the Old Testament is all full of God's wrath. It's, it's God is, God is there's, there's, there's violence, all this stuff. Well, when you put in the context of fall, right, the fall, sin, and it's leading to redemption, and it came from a perfect creation, you see that all those texts, all that narrative, is showing us how much we need this redemption. How far we've gone, we've come from this perfect creation. And so when you read those texts and read that narrative, you see a people struggling to live and understand uh, how to live. Again, the beeping, just ignore. Um, hopefully we don't need to evacuate, I think we're, I think we're good. Um, you see people, you see these people trying to live and understand who God is and learn who God is, while also trying to figure out um, how to be a light to the nation so that redemption can come. 
right? Because they're called to be a light and a people of God, and they're supposed to be the vehicle to bring the Messiah. And so this is all happening to bring redemption along. That helps you understand it a little bit better. So um, this framework, you can actually fit any theme into any of those four parts as you read the scriptures. So let's just take the Messiah. We already started talking about him, but we're talking about we have this biblical theology of the Messiah, and so when you read Genesis, for instance, and you're saying, okay, where's the Messiah in here? Well, we see him in creation, right? He's there, we're created in, uh, we're created in the image of God, right? So we see there that if things remain perfect, well, we don't need anyone to save us. We're already in the saving, we're, we're with God, we're in perfect communion with God, right? But then Genesis 3 happens. And you have the fall all the way, you know, all the way through to the redemption, to, to redemption in Christ. Um, and when that, when that appears. <clears throat> and so in Genesis 3, uh, as early as so the fall happens and right away you see the Messiah in Genesis 3.15. It's called the proto-gospel, um, the early gospel. You, you see it there. There's a prophecy in the consequences for Adam and Eve's sin. There's a, there's a, prophetic promise of a rescuer. And you can trace that all the way through the scriptures. You can trace the seed, that word seed, all the way through the scriptures. And so you have here the Messiah, and we're searching for that person the whole time through the fall. We're searching, if you read this, this is why I say it's so cool to read the scriptures from front to back, because you are searching for that person, because you recognize in 315, and you're like, oh wait, oh here's Abraham. Oh wait, actually before that, here's Noah. Is he the guy? Is he the guy who's gonna save us? Well, he does save humanity in a sense, but then he gets drunk in his tent, so no, he's not the guy. Oh wait, here's Abraham, is he the guy? Oh, God's given him so many promises, the new covenant that he's giving him, the Abrahamic covenant, not the new covenant, but a new one to Abraham. Uh, Abraham's called out of a polytheistic culture to serve, uh, to serve God. And is this the guy? Well, no, he ends up not trusting God in his promise and doing his own thing. Uh, and this happens all through the scriptures, right? Joseph, Judah, uh, Joshua, Moses, the judges, um, da Saul, David, Solomon, uh, prophets, kings, on and on and on until you get to Jesus. And it, it like, it's this building of anticipation when you read the scripture, like, oh man, it's building, man, you have all these prophets saying, no, he's coming, he's coming, just wait, he's coming. Like, keep on preparing, keep on searching, keep on seeking, stop following after the ways of this world, stop following after those other gods, keep on seeking uh, Christ, keep on seeking the Christ, the Messiah. He's coming to save us, he's coming to rescue us. And then when he finally comes, it's like this culmination in Matthew when he comes, this genealogical thing, and it's so beautiful. And then we start to read about redemption and the Messiah and then new creation and, and all, and we can fit the Messiah into that larger framework. And guys, you can take any one of your themes that you came up with, and probably any one of your themes, I don't know what's on your, <laughs> I don't know what you guys came up with, but um, any number of themes you can take and you can understand the Bible through that lens. And you can read through the whole Bible with just looking at that, with just looking at that, uh, at that thing, at the Messiah or at the kingdom of God. And you can do that over and over and over and over again. And there's such a beauty and majesty to it because you are actually being with God. You're actually in his presence. And guys, most, most times when I read the scriptures, I just, Go to it with being in God's presence. And I don't, I don't know, it's, it's weird. It's not like I receive this grand revelation, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. But I receive this molding in my heart. I receive this transformation in my mind and I feel it. Like I can actually f almost feel it physically. Like this, this transformation, that like, like that truth is now forming me. And then that leads me in my life. And, and so guys, you cannot experience the abundant life in Christ without being in the Word of God. We have to have that. We have to be in it. We have to be with God. And, and you can say, well, uh, well, no, I'm not going to go down there. 
here's the thing. We have access to the word and the word paired with the spirit is what God has given us to walk forward in this life. And so use it. Use the word, use the spirit. We live in a country, we live in a time where we all have access to it freely. You don't even have to buy a Bible. You can download a free app on your phone, right? So make use of it and explore with God because I guarantee you it will lead to the abundant life. You'll experience Jesus in ways that you've never done before. And he wants you there with him in that space. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that, God, you've chosen to spoken to us, uh, to speak to us, that you have spoken to us through your word, that you gave us this book to show us how to live, to show us how to be like you. Thank you that we have this. May we not take it for granted. Help us to just fall in love with you through it and to just desire your instruction and your words and your formation, your discipline, your rebuke, your teaching, your correcting, your training in righteousness. More than money, more than, more than food, more than those things that we think we need. May we, may we not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so thank you, Jesus, for this book. Form us by it as we, as we uh, do so in your spirit. In your name, amen. Thank you, Mike, for leading us in that way. And now is our time to respond. And so we've had about half an hour of listening, allowing uh, Mike's words to pour over us. But at the same time, this is a very spiritual act that something is being formed in you and the Holy Spirit is moving. And so hopefully you've been paying attention to that, that some point of conviction has come to you, some point of affirmation, some point of encouragement, some point of building up and strengthening has been uh, happening as you've been listening and as, uh, as, as this time has been going on together. And now is our time to respond and here it is this book this book much can be said about this book and there are many places that we all stand in our journey going through this and we are gonna sing about welcoming and taking on the adventure of faith and life with God despite comfort and despite the fact that it seems maybe even scary and that might be the exact place you are with the Bible, and it might be the exact place you need to go, um, which is away from fear into the adventure. And so that's why when it comes to this book, I encourage you, like Mike started with, just read it over and over and over. And so let's go off onto the adventure of Scripture. And I can tell you guys that when I picked up this book almost 10 years ago, uh, maybe not for the first time, but seriously started reading it for the first time almost 10 years ago, uh, and I read through the whole thing, it changed everything for me. And so I hope that happens for you as well. So let's sing about the great adventure and ask God to send us out boldly on that adventure through his word. I bless you with that in Jesus' name. So let's rise as a community formed by the word, and let's sing to God. One, two, three, four, five, six.
to sing praises to our God. And I always, um, I never want this time to end, but guys, guess what? It doesn't end right now because we get to, uh, right now we get to release you into our threes where it's just going to continue. We're gonna respond to the Lord through other areas. You can continue with worship. You can continue to pray with one another and to, um, explore giving and, and communion. And these are the things that you get to do together. And so um, R3 is so important and we would love for everyone to be a part of one. And if you're not a part of one, let us know so that we can connect you. You can find it on our website. You can find it below. Um, there's a link in the in the subscription there that you can see that. It is it is there for you. There's avenues there for you to get plugged in to, um, to community in this way. And so now we're just going to release you to, to do that, to experience this fully for this time with the Lord not to end for hearing um, hearing from him um, praying with one another it's it's a beautiful time to continue what the Lord is doing has been doing already um, throughout this time and it gets to continue now and so you are blessed uh, with the peace of Christ in order to continue that um, today let's go <laughs> 